Welcome to the 25th anniversary edition of the Finger Lakes Environmental Film Festival. We remind ourselves that we are running this festival as climate catastrophes multiply and intensify, when over 6 million people worldwide have died from COVID, and when the people of Ukraine are fighting the brutal Russian invasion. For all of us at FLEF, the world is our why. I'm Anne Michelle, festival producer for the Finger Lakes Environmental Film Festival, which we call FLEF. Major sponsors for FLEF include the Park Foundation and Ithaca College. Our festival theme this year is Entanglements, a concept that explores how different environments, ideas, imaginaries, places, politics, practices, registers, and species twist into each other and enmesh. We are very honored that you've joined us today for this great session, IDOCs and More Than Human Encounters. We ask that you please rename yourself with your physical location after your name. Today's session is a collaborative partnership between CLEF and IDOCs. We invite you to stay on this Zoom after the session concludes at 1.30 Eastern time, which will be well past tea time in the UK, but we're gonna have an informal gathering to celebrate today's presenters and explore any ideas further. It'll last about another extra 15 minutes for all who wanna stay on. It is now with great pleasure that I introduce you to today's moderator, Patricia Zimmerman. She is the Charles A. Dana Professor of Screen Studies at Ithaca College and the director of FLEF. Thank you, Annie, and welcome everyone to this really exciting session today on IDOCs and More Than Human. I want to start with uh, thanking you all for coming, and secondly, just giving you a brief rundown of our format for today. There'll be um, each of our three speakers will do a five minute presentation, then we'll have about 20 minutes of crosstalk between our speakers, moderated by me. And then uh, we'll move to about 30 minutes of discussion with our audience. And we ask that you raise your digital hand and we'll bring you on camera to join the discussion. Uh, we ask everyone to keep their questions and comments short so that we can include as many voices as possible. We'll conclude with some closing thoughts from our uh, three fabulous uh, presenters. And then of course, our after party for more informal conversation. Um, I'm gonna introduce all three of our speakers at the same time, just so we can save time and go uh, right into the event. Um, our three speakers today are key, important, prominent figures in the world of exploring new media, documentary, and IDOCs. Uh, they have opened up so many new vistas for all of us on this Zoom today. Um, and I, I feel personally I owe them a great debt for bringing me into a whole new world of ideas and a whole new community internationally. Uh, Mandy Rose is Professor of Documentary and Digital Cultures at UWE Bristol and Director of the Digital Cultures Research Center. Uh, she's worked extensively in nonfiction film, TV and emerging media. Um, during her 20 years at the BBC, she led participatory and interactive projects, including the BBC Two's pioneering Video Nation project. She is the co-editor of the book, IDOCs, The Evolving Practices of Interactive Documentary and co-convener of the IDOC Symposium. Sandra Godenzi is course leader at the University of Westminster of DisLab, the first UK MA to be totally dedicated to interactive storytelling. She's played a leading role in the development of DCRC's IDOC Symposium and website and is part of its research group. And she is also one of the co-editors of the book, IDOC's Evolving Practices of Interactive Documentary, which is a groundbreaking book in the field of documentary. Judith Aston is an associate professor, Walscourt Fellow in Film and Digital Arts at UWE Bristol. And she too is a co-founder of IDOC's, chair of the RAI Film Committee, and it, very active member of the university's Digital Cultures Research Center. Her collaboration with Stefano Odorico on polyphonic documentary is the latest manifestation of this ongoing endeavor. So Mandy, 
tossing the baton to you. Okay. Um, thanks, Patty. And thanks so much for the invitation to be here on, on behalf of all three of us. It's an honor to be part of this uh, festival that we've been hearing so much about for so many years. So thanks, Patty, Annie, and the team. Um, I need to share my slides, so I'll do that right now. Um, here we are. So, okay, all right. So, um, so Sandra, Judith and I are, are coming at the theme of the more than human from slightly different directions. But what we share is an interest in how IDOCs, by which we mean interactive, immersive, and other forms of expanded documentary practice, um, how they offer, how they can offer a window onto what is widely unseen, usually unseen, and also how they can reveal our entanglement with each other, with um, other living species, and with the non-living world. Um, so I'm, I'm talking here about how my interest in how, in the context of the climate and ecological emergency, um, documentary makers are exploring the potential of immersive media to engage more than human um, themes and perspectives. There's lots of interesting work. And even if I just looked around me in the southwest of England, I could talk about Duncan Speakman's wonderful immersive media, like his only expansion project, Mitch Turnbull's um, terrific um, Earth Songs, uh, a mixed reality piece, or anagrams, messages to uh, augmented reality piece, uh, messages to a non human Earth. Um, but I'm going to focus right now on, on virtual reality, or perhaps better put, mixed reality, and um, I hope I can explain that difference to you. So it, uh, what you're looking at now is a screen grab from a, a mediography of um, virtual reality nonfiction that we assembled during a research project that I was involved in between 2017 and 20. Um, here are just some of the projects that emerged on what you might call themes of the natural world during that period. Um, and after the Oculus kit, uh, the Oculus developer kit became available to makers in 2013, there was a kind of rush to embrace virtual reality by nonfiction media makers. And lots of, pro lots of people took advantage of 360 video and VR to give participants a feeling of getting up close with wild animals and remote wilderness locations. Um, so uh, in some ways, these projects, I feel, or many of these projects, perpetuate a kind of nature-culture divide. Um, and what interests me more is how the affordances of immersive media can disrupt that divide and highlight a human-centric worldview. Um, so I'm going to focus on one particular project, or rather a, a trilogy, by uh, an English agency, Marshmallow Laser Feast, who between 2015 and 2020 produced three projects based on virtual reality, um, which explore or try to provide a fresh encounter with aspects of the non-human. So this is a still from In the Eyes of the Animal, a project which arose from a commission by a UK festival called Abandoned Normal Devices and a site visit to the Grisdale Forest in the Lake District. Um, Marshmallow Laser Feast Robin McNicholas explained that the team sought to explore the sensory perspectives of the animals that lived in the forest by taking physical samples of the environment, sonic samples for the soundtrack, and a 360 degree LIDAR scan, a digital sample of the environment too. Um, Marshmallow Laser Feast then interpreted these materials based on what's known about the visual perception of three forest creatures, dragonfly, frog, and owl. Um, so in terms of the experience, um, when, you, when you do this project, you, you wear a little haptic jacket and a VR headset. And in the headset, you, you see through the perspective of these three creatures um, that you can select. Um, this haptic jacket uh, buzzes or hums or throbs, depending on which creature you're seeing, you know, which creature's perspective you're seeing. Um, uh, and the original participants 
who saw this project at the end of a forest walk in Grisdale itself. So they also had the kind of tactile experience of the forest floor and the moss and uh, the forest around them. So this, this project, as I mentioned, uses LIDAR scans. LIDAR, along with photogrammetry and other forms of volumetric capture, um, are ways of seeing, ways of capturing images beyond the lens, beyond the kind of lens that's dominated, obviously, film, photography, film, and video culture. Um, forms of, of, of image capture that kind of go beyond that kind of idea of the human eye as the capture device and offer perspectives that the human eye couldn't grasp. Um, and in doing so, as you experience uh, in the eyes of the animal, you have this kind of provocative um, and enchanting kind of offer of the viewpoint as if of another creature. So the second project in this trilogy was Tree, Hug Tree Hugger, which came out in 26, 2017 um, and developed Marshmallow Laser Feast exploration of embodiment in immersive media. Um, Sandra, Judith and I went to the South Bank in London and experienced this together uh, memorably. So the piece concerns, as, as, as this image probably makes clear, a giant sequoia tree here again captured through LIDAR scanning. It's a mixed realities piece. You're, Im you're immersed in a VR headset you literally embrace a model of a giant tree. Um, and then the visuals evoke the flows of water up through the trunk, the flows which sustain life within this kind of century old, centuries old creature. And I found it a, a memorable, you know, if not transcendent experience, which actually has stayed with me and really kind of influenced my feeling about trees. Um, and it's in, and it's and this piece engages not just with um, what Brian Winston's called technologies of seeing, but also with technologies of corporeality. Um, so it's a media experience in which the body, which is about the body as much as about sight. So the third experience. Um, oh, uh, yeah, okay. The third um, experience by Marshmallow Laser Feast, we live in an ocean of air, is a social VR experience in which the porousness between um, human self and the air around us and other living beings is highlighted through the visual rendering of exhalation and inhalation in a forest environment. I'm just gonna play a little trailer for this piece from when it showed at the Phi Center in Montreal. Um, so it's a room scale piece in which you move around and between others represented as avatars. So you're aware of other people's movements within the space. Um, so these three pieces by Marshmallow Laser Feast in my view, they engender less a feeling of mastery over nature, more a feeling that our colleague, Julia Scott Stevenson, who's now moved back to Australia, has called bewilderment, um, a feeling of you know, uncertainty um, in the face of the beauty, the vastness and complexity of our world, um, and a perspective on, of our place within that world. So I would say, you know, that all media technologies in a way augment the human world. We can think of Marsh, um, Marshall McLuhan's idea of, of technology and media of it as an extension of man, but immersive platforms, which have recently become accessible to producers, offer ways of seeing and of sensing that lend themselves to this project of reorienting towards the more than human world. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I will pass on to Sandra. Thank you, thank you, Mandy. I have to say I have very fond memories of going, uh, the three of us to see this, uh, you know, the, you know the, these pieces was amazing, transcendental, as you said. Okay, I'm gonna share, let's see if I am sharing. I think I am, let me know if I don't. Um, and I thought since um, our theme was very much about augmentation today, I would start with what do I mean by augmentation? Um, 
And um, I think the first thing that comes to mind is uh, very simply, you know, it's to make things bigger. That's what the word means. Um, and so what it means to me is to make things visible to us so that we can look at them differently. So on that, I think Mandy, actually the three of us have very similar ideas of what we mean by this augmentation. You know, we're just trying today to tap it from different point of views. And so the more than human that I would like to explore today with you is actually, I've chosen the virus as um, a topic. And uh, uh, the virus, what I'm trying to do today is to go through some uh, interactive project that were done during the Corona period. And the reason I'm interested in the virus is that um, if you think about it, it's both outside of us and inside of us, yeah? And um, it is mutating through us, but we are actually also changing because of the virus. So it is a relationship of mutual transformation, which is very much what we're thinking about what, you know, what is our relationship with our environment. Um, so I'm gonna share um, three examples. Um, they don't always, they use all different technologies. And I think there are three examples which are thinking about, you know, augmentation basically. Um, first example is uh, window swap. Um, I have a bit of it for you to, it will run while I speak a little bit about it. This is a collaborative project done by a, a group of artists. And actually the invitation here is to share 10 minutes of the view from your window. So it's, it's a still view. I mean, it's a video, but you know, nothing moves apart from what happens in your video. And this is when we were stuck all at home. So for me, this is an example of how video used through the internet and within a collaborative project can actually be used to augment our feelings. And here is the feeling of stillness, but it's also the feeling of being connected and we are connected through the isolation in which we are. So we're asked not to look at our own environment because when we're on the website, we look at other people's environment. And this is probably where the augmentation here is. Uh, we don't see humans, we don't see the virus, but what we see is actually how the virus has actually allowed us to look at the vastness of our world, our diversities in our world, and basically what other people are seeing. So we are suddenly augmented this idea of our shared world. Um, second project um, I'd like to, you know, to share with you is a project called uh, We Used To. And this is done by um, a design studio called um, Olafur Elison. So this is a big, it's a bit more of a, of a, of a I was about to say a corporate project. Um, of course it's not, it is also an artistic project. And it's also a participatory project, but the invitation here is to ask people to share text. So it's only text. And you, the only thing you have to do, you have two prompts, two questions if you want and you're sharing about the effect that the virus had on our perception uh, of ourselves and our relationship to the world. So the two, two prompts are, and you can see how people can actually write on it, is I or we used to dot, 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 so you can write what you want. And then the second one is now I or we dot, dot, dot. So effectively what is augmented here is changed. It's a visualization of change, of how on a personal level, and on a collective level, um, we have moved through these pandemic uh, times. And it's both a sort of micro and meta visualization of how the virus actually has transformed us. Um, sorry, I need to move next. Um, last project is Corona Haikus. Um, this is a project where I was personally um, you know, part of it together with uh, Sander Tavares Duque and also actually the whole Corona Haiku community, and I know we have some of the Corona Haiku community with us today, so that's super exciting. Um, this again is a participatory project and um, it started as a, a Facebook group. So this is using social media to, and mobile phones to augment ourselves. It then moved into a website and the invitation here was to um, create visual haikus, which is a form of visual poetry, three photos and a short text. But the real aim here is to look at our environment yet again differently, and this time in a mindful way, and to somehow rediscover our relationship between our inner emotion and our outer world. So that is what it's been linked. 
And what I wanted to share um, with you today is, um, is, is, a, is another phase of this project where we are um, starting to, this is literally a prototype and you know, the first people um, watching it. Um, but here we're really thinking to use augmented reality. So for once we're augmenting with augmented reality, I think to play it, I need to do this, yes. And here the idea is slightly different. It's about uh, using poetry done by others. So those are visual haikus done by others, but to bring them inside your private space through your mobile phone again, using um, AR enhanced Instagram filters and giving life to this poetry. And the shadows visit. I'm gonna stop for a second because what you're seeing is uh, actually um, um, a haiku done by Sandra Terrares, which is now unloading and opening into your own room so that um, what you're asked to do is to uh, reflect again on, you know, where am I now, what have I learned, and then share through um, some other um, social media, this time Instagram, your own digital poetry. So this being said, pretty much, um, those were three examples. And um, what has been augmented here? Effectively, I think fundamentally, it's our relationship with the world and our way of looking is the thing that is being augmented. And more than human can be a lot of things. What I have used here is the virus, but the virus is a bit of an excuse to think about the threat at the moment we have the war. And effectively, anything in our environment that provokes change in us really changes the dynamics. And this is what is being augmented through those projects. And why would iDocs be good at this is because they are relational. They are about linking and putting us into a, a dynamic environment that we can change. And therefore, it's our agency that makes us look differently and transform our relationship with the environment. So this is pretty much what I wanted to share with you and I will let link and pass on the baton to Judith. Hello. So, so yes, I am picking up on this idea of transformation and um, looking at, I'm going to look at one project today and that's a project that I have set up uh, and it's building on everything that we've been talking about for years in IDOTS, and it's particularly focusing on the idea of multi-perspectivity and how we can use IDOTS to look at, into ourselves in the way that Sandra was talking about, you know, how the um, virus has transformed us and led to a, a reflection on who we are and how we relate to the um, more than human. And so through this project, Polyphonic Documentary, it's building on the multi-perspectival aspects of IDOCs and the aesthetic of multiple windows. So it's quite retro. It, it's building on the where IDOCs began for us, if you like, with, with this multiple screen, multiple windows, ways of thinking about the way we tell our stories and um, just questioning the very anthropocentric form of storytelling that, that we've sort of settled into and the idea of dramatic narratives and the idea of conflict and the ideas of binaries it's all very anthropocentric and I'm an anthropologist and uh, I'm interested in cross-cultural approaches to story Tim Ingold is a key anthropologist who looks very closely at the relationship between humans and the more than human and how we can correspond with the world in in ways to create um new ways of formulating are how we engage with the more than human. So I am going to share my screen. I'm going to pull up uh, the project. I've got a screencast of it, and um, I'm going to play that in the background while I talk about the project. So just so that you get a sense of it, you'll get a link to it later on, so you can look at it there. So for this project, we, we have a community of people from the IDOCS world. There's about 75 people in a Discord social media community where we are exploring together interactive documentary. We're exploring how um, polyphony might, be, might play out in these forms, in these uh, multiple windows database type structures. And we invited members of that community to submit um, three to five short videos where they um, were reflecting on what polyphony meant to them. As the first intervention, 
Stefano, who I've convened this project with, he's in another meeting today, so uh, he might he's hoping to come along later. But we worked with Florian Talhofer, who's one of my, I've got three PhD students who are working on this common theme with me. Um, you know, we're, we're working very collaboratively, actually, and they're all here today as well. Um, but we worked with Florian, who was the inventor of Korsakoff, which is a, an auto interactive authoring tool for those who don't know it, um, which doesn't have a linear timeline and which puts clips into a much more relational dynamic between each of them. And so it, it creates a more dialogic way of looking at different media clips. And it's like a mirror and you, you can, it's very exploratory and it throws things up at you in quite random, unexpected ways. And it's not, it refuses drama. So it's, it's a way of dealing with, with media in a non-dramatic way. So this is just, this is the first prototype. And we um, called a meeting with all, all the participants 25 literally from all over the world and we started looking at what we might do next different ways that we might use this software we're going to do another project in a, a different tool called storm away and it, it's very much us as a community of people looking at how can we as makers and practitioners engage with what's going on in the world engage with the climate crisis and how can we maybe tell stories differently and how can we use these tools um, to explore that so um, we're doing that and we've got a reading group and uh, we're going to do more projects and it's at the moment it's not funded we're just kind of doing it as a collective co-creative collaborative um, adventure if you like um, where we're community building and uh, this book it's this is the idea of the pluriverse which is very current now it's very current I can't really see it that's called designs for the pluriverse by Arturo Escobar who is an anthropologist and what he um, what he says is that um, we used to think in anthropology that culture was a surface thing that manifested difference but it was about translating cultures it was translating one culture for another culture to get to the deep structure that united us all a kind of monological view of the world whereas now um, anthropology is, is thinking more that actually we might not necessarily have one common worldview and there might be different perspectives and that those different perspectives, we need to put them into dialogue with each other and we need to think beyond modernity and we need to think beyond the extractive cultures of progress and technology. And um, we need to work with indigenous um, worldviews. We need to work with um, science, you know, all these different systems of knowledge. And how can we put them into dialogue with each other? And how can we use tools like this, perhaps, to put those different perspectives and ideas together and, and put them into a relational dialogue to help with the creative problem solving that we need in order to engage in a more sustainable way um, and, and build a sustainable future for, for all of us. So that's what we're trying to do. And as I say, my three PhD students are working on this theme as well. And um, we will be doing more projects. And as we do more creative interventions, we'll be inviting, you know, people can join us and collaborate with us. And it, it's in the spirit of co-creation that, you know, collectively we need to work on these things and we need to, transform ourselves and transform the way we think about ourselves in relation to the more than human and how we might use these tools to create um, more sustainable forms of engagement. So uh, that is what I have to say for now. I'll stop sharing. Excellent. And thank you, uh, Mandy, Sandra and Judith. Um, and let's take about 15 minutes and, and really have some crosstalk amongst uh, all of us. And um, you know, I'm gonna encourage you all to interrogate and ask questions of each other, but I wanna start with just a question to kick us off. Uh, you've all referred to augmentation in one way or another. Uh, you've referred to it in terms of technologies that are emerging that can do this. You've referred to it in terms of ideas. You've referred to it in terms of spaces and places. And you refer to it in terms of people. And you refer to it in terms of 
how we see, how we sense the world. So I wonder if I could ask each of you to uh, to parse that out a little more for us. Um, you know, uh, is, there, is there a way we can understand the why and especially the how of or augmentation? Mandy, you're ch shaking your head the most, so I'm gonna go to you first. Sure, yeah, indeed. I mean, I made a passing reference to Marshall McLuhan, um, who, who the uh, Canadian media theorist who, who um, discussed technology itself as an extension of man, this idea that, you know, we make these technologies to, to reach out into our environments in new ways. So he talked about the mail, let alone the TV, uh, as, as extensions, ag or, as augmentations. Um, and it seems to me like we're in a moment of proliferating um, media affordances where lots of new possibilities are coming online at the same time. And I guess, yeah, the ones that I've been preoccupied with that I kind of alluded to is this kind of shift from media as something which is essentially about seeing, which kind of, you know, is a tradition going back to the Renaissance, the kind of, you know, tradition of, of, of Renaissance perspective and, and the, the, the eye, the eye of the artist, um, that shift from that we're seeing as these new capture technologies come online, for example, but these new embodied possibilities of media emerge. So we're seeing a kind of proliferation of new possibilities, which in a way have been a central concern for us within IDOCS, you know, thinking about these new media affordances, as we call them, these new affordances of interaction, of, of immersion. And so I've just been, you know, really observing it with great interest how, you know, one couldn't say that, um, one couldn't say that I mean, no, how, how producers are grasping these affordances in this context of urgency around climate cri crisis and ecological crisis, they're grasping them and, and, and kind of running with them in terms of offering ways into those, those crises and, you know, in some ways, positive ways of rethinking the anthrop anthropocentrism that we've all been heir to. <laughs> mm. Yeah, uh, Sandra, you want to jump in? Yes. An augmentation. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I think on these, I mean, you, we probably have a, a fairly um, similar ideas of, the, you know, this is why we're excited and interested and we've been looking and, and, and studying uh, uh, interactivity and iDocs for, you know, all of us more than 20 years, probably. It's because I think we are, the three of us are kind of obsessed with the idea of complexity. So if the world is mm -hmm. complex, if the world is much more than what I can grasp um, from my stand and my point of view, well, for sure, the, you know, what we, we can do to, is to expand and to try to embrace this complexity. Now, any media, as uh, Mandy, you were saying, you know, is doing that. You know, um, I watch TV and I watch, uh, you know, a documentary about traveling. Well, I'm, you know, I am being exposed and expanded um, through another reality that is not mine. So that has always been the case. So, so this, the novelty in IDOX is, is just that it opens it up to more than one media, to a sensory feeling and sensory options, as uh, um, Mandy was saying. But I think also that it demands us to do something. And so for me, the agency there is the thing that adds to what all other medias could have done in the past. Uh, because it asked me also to take a stand. And by doing this, I become aware of who I am, who I was before, and therefore I really change, expand, and, you know, become, I'm still human, <laughs> but hopefully, you know, a slightly more complex human. <laughs> and, and your but, point is really uh, interesting because it's about augmenting agency, right? That's what totally. I got out of what you said. Yeah. Totally. Uh, and Judith, can we, we pull, uh, Judith, can we pull you in? Yeah, I, I just... Augmentation. Yeah, so we when augmentation is, you know, it's one of the latest words, you know, it's augmented reality, virtual reality. There's a kind of very technology-led conversation out there. And um, I think we're all, we all agree on this, that, you know, it, it, there's, there's an irony with IDOPS because we are, you know, we're looking at emerging and evolving technological platforms. But I think we've always, within IDOPS, been very concerned about not being technocentric and about looking at those in relation to humanity and what it means to be human. 
and you know how we can use our agency you know and, and how we can if you like use these tools for good and, and for the better and um, Marshall McLuhan talked about the technological extension of consciousness in, and of course these tools do influence the way you know our ways of seeing and our ways of being um, you know it goes right back to 2001 and the um, the clip with the the apes and the you know the kind of opposable thumb you know technology of course is a dance with us and, and how we behave and see ourselves in the world but we're very keen to put humans at the center and to take responsibility as humans which is where we're looking at augmentation as essentially human thing that's about looking into ourselves and how we can augment our understanding and challenge the way we look out into the world and the way we use these technologies um, to basically augment our relationship with the more than human in, in Judith, ways that be positive. You know what I was thinking is that in, a, in, a, in an interesting way, um, very little of what I've seen in augmented reality as, you know, mm. using apps or whatever is actually really augmenting what mm. we're all speaking about, <laughs> I don't know if you agree. But it's often used to, you know, um, I, I've been playing a lot with uh, Instagram filters because we're trying to use them for uh, the Corona Haiku project. And all you can find is actually, you know, a camera looking at you and transforming you with uh, bunny ears and doing selfies. And all this is about me, 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 me. Mm. And absolutely not about augmenting what the world is. So I think it's, 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 it's interesting. And maybe we can keep it for the wider discussion later to think that mm -hmm. You know, augmentation um, is so much more than what we are doing at the moment with the technology that is supposed to be augmenting our possibilities, mm. you know. Mm. Um, we're, we're interested in spaces for reflect. I mean, I think there's a common thing in, in all the projects that we were talking about is creating spaces for reflection, for, for slowing down, for looking more deeply, you know. Um, yeah, we're probably against the, the kind of technology, technology. people <laughs> in yeah. the field. Yeah. So, yeah. Mandy, you wanted you wanted to chip in. So, yeah, yes. I, I I was just super aware that May Abdallah had joined us um, mm. while we were just talking, and I was thinking talking of augmented reality. Perhaps when we get to the discussion, May might have we something to there. say. To talk about you know the rather wonderful message messages to a post-human Earth, which precisely was about augmenting the natural world of a park and you know inviting you to think about the lives of you know growing creatures in a park space so yeah i just i just felt mm. aware yeah, of no, that. there are exceptions thanks yeah. god but i think really also in this type of forum i think you know my 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 wish is really to 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 push for that type of understanding of augmentation for more creative project of that sort because mm. i think that's the opportunity that should be grasped that's about the artist as well isn't it it's what you bring to the technology and the the ideas and you know the, that we bring but, to the we use the technology don't we it's up to us and i really appreciate the uh, this conversation moving to asking us to consider augmentation beyond tech companies selling mm -hmm. augmented reality and moving us beyond tech and I think what you've all been saying right now strikes me as uh, your, what you all have in common in the projects you showed is this idea of augmenting complexity, augmenting layers, augmenting, intensifying um, uh, mixes between the virtual, the embodied, and the fantastic or the imaginary. And uh, as I listened to you just now, uh, I had a new thought, which is I think what you are talks I'll share is thinking of augmentation as a kind of combustion engine to reimagine futures and mm -hmm. combusting things in new kind of ways, kind of the pluriversal machine to, uh, uh, to get Judith's ideas in here. Mm -hmm. um, I want to move to one other, one other question before we open it up, if that's okay. Uh, if you can hold that thought, Mandy, is that all right? Um, yeah. And you know, the title of this session is More Than Human, uh, More Than Human, Non-Human, Beyond Human are so au courant in all of our fields uh, right now. And, you know, I was really struck by as we were getting ready to do this, I had a lot of people ask me, what does more than human mean? 
you know, from <laughs> high school people to college students to colleagues to a few people who registered who wrote to me, you know, what is more than human? Uh, so can, can I ask you again? Um, oh, there we have another book. Oh, yeah. Okay, Chat Wranglers, get that book in there. Uh, could we talk about uh, some basic definitions uh, of where you're coming from as you think about this idea of more than human um, to, to anchor us a little bit as we move forward to the discussion? So shall I start having pop David Abrams onto the screen? Yes. yes. Um, because yes, I mean, in fact, I actually did one of those Google word searches you can do across time the other day, because I, you know, I, you know, like all of us, this, this, this phrase more than human has entered my kind of my, my view in the last few years. And, you know, after a while, I started thinking, where did this term come from, you know, and while, mm -hmm. I, while doing my Google search showed me that the term had been used going back to the beginning of the 20th century, I do believe that it's David Abram who brought the term to kind of popularity and 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 he was doing he was a magician who went to Indone Indonesia to do his PhD research looking at, <laughs> at magic and medicine and you know began to realize that uh, that at the heart of what was happening in some of the shaman's activity in the village that he was in was a kind of intercession between the human and the more than human world that in this village he lived in there was no activity that humans did that didn't have to be thought about in relation to its, I don't know, impact might be a rather too literal word, but in relation to, in, in its relationship to the, the other living species and the, the non-living world around the village. And in a way that was the work the shaman did was to think about that relationship. So, so you know, yeah, and I guess, you know, I see it as kind of intrinsic to, well, to extractive capitalism, frankly, that we don't take that into account. And actually it's, you know, the story of the crisis we're in is of living in a, in a world where we're not taking on board our impacts, you know, and where we're seeing, where, you know, kind of anthropocentric point of view. So yeah, so that's, to, to perhaps that explains a little more how I think. Can, of I, can I pick up on that? It's just because you're talking about Indonesia, I, because um, when I was at the grand age of 18, <laughs> I spent a year in Indonesia doing voluntary work in Java. And that, I mean, that completely refigured, reconfigured my sense of self and my sense of being. And, and just that that whole world of the porosity b between the um the magical, the what we in the West might call irrational. And and I lived in a house with multiple generations and we used to sit up till late at night talking about, you know, Western science and Eastern spiritualism and how we just needed more of a open door between those worlds. And, you know, now Francesco Varela, you know, he's been doing a lot of work with neuroscience and the Dalai Lama. And um, that's my thing about putting these multiple different knowledge systems into dialogue with each other. And um, now, you know, there's a lot more stuff around indigenous cultures. And only yesterday I was at a, an indigenous elders council, you know, it was an online event that was by the University of Ontario. But, you know, we can we can access these things through Zoom. And, and there's much more. I think there's a growing awareness of, of the importance of, you know, modernity. We used to call those awful words in anthropology, like, you know, tribal culture and um, pre-modern and you know the natives and stuff and and now that we're seeing much more of um a dialogue and a much more of actually appreciation of the importance of these knowledge systems that you know and um linked to biodiversity of course in in areas that are curated looked after by in indigenous cultures there's there's a much higher rate of biodiversity so that's living proof that we really do need to engage with these things so yeah Sandra, you want to get in on the more than human yeah, interrogation? I, think, you know, I mean, as always, uh, um, it has been covered, so it's fine. I'm, I'm very happy mm -hmm. with everything that has been said so far. Um, of course, there is spirituality. There is the, the what we cannot sense. The the you know sort of the idea of our belief systems in general and how we uh, relate to the world. It's rocks. It's uh, you know it's 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 everything living and non living pretty much. Um, but not us. And I think, so I don't have um, a definition, but I know that the reason for which I'm interested in this idea of non-human is that 
we have this tendency in our society to think that you know we we exist you know and and there is the world and and those two things are separate while we only exist within our environment i have a very constructivist view of of the world so if we live if we are part of the environment the environment is us and we are the environment so what needs to be interesting is to understand how we mesh we entangle we 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 interact with each other and this is exactly what we're doing with uh, interactive narrative really and that's that's wonderful i love this idea of when we're thinking about the more than human that we're actually moving to really thinking environmentally right where there are not separations where there are processes enmeshments entanglements where we are not apart from the environment we're actually part of it and okay. to you all raise these questions of relationality. Um, I want to uh, move to getting our participants involved now. Um, if you would like to join us uh, and join this conversation, uh, we ask that you raise your digital hand and um, we will bring you in to the conversation and we will spotlight you and get you in. Uh, I'm going to ask everyone including our wonderful speakers to have their comments be short because we would like a pluriversal polyphonic discussion here that has as many voices on the table as we can possibly have. So um, uh, I'm gonna just open it to our participants now, if that's okay with everybody. And let's bring in Timothy Hannon. Uh, hi, thanks. Uh, I guess it's a little more of a technical question but a little more than that uh first of all the, the augmented reality stuff's pretty awesome uh how how do you learn all this stuff or who do you get to help you with this and you know how, how did, did you know that this was what you wanted to use to you know for your message um it is this a question for me? Sorry, Timothy. In the uh, sense yeah, yeah, I yeah. I think I'm the only one who uses uh, an augmented reality um, example, so I suspect it's for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do well? You know, with the metaverse, that basically VR and AR are going to be the next things on the block. So there's going to be a lot of money invested in it, and at the moment, there's quite a few softwares that allow you to actually work with uh, both augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, and of course, uh, you know, some of them are more famous than others. I might put them in the chat, but not say them because I don't particularly want to plug anybody. Um, but the reason for which we went for Instagram filters, it was specifically because um, we didn't want people to have yet another app. You normally have to download an app in order to see augmented reality. And so that is a bit of a problem. While I think most people would use Instagram, and augmented reality is already embedded in, into Instagram as filters. But guess what? I think it's used for, I was about to say, for, for things which are nonsensical. I mean, that would be really judgmental of me. But what I mean is like, it, it's, it, there is, we all have a phone that allows us to use augmented reality and we use it for things that I personally am not interested in. So our thinking was, how do we um, use what exists, but actually, for the good to to create more relationship between us between you know more creativity and 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 so that we we actually do AR for good as we had VR for good so this is a little bit an obsession of ours to go um, pretty much against the way social media has been used so far but not to neglect it to actually use it and transform it and to see to show that there are other ways of doing it if you google a little bit online AR authoring tool you'll find quite a few and they're often free so that's not too much of an issue if that was your question and timothy you raise a great question because of course in the world of new media and idocs this question of how is very much front and center all the time and uh our speakers are showing projects they made they're also showing projects from other artists and they're showing collaborative projects and that how question is really front and center for thank you for reminding us uh anna vial let's bring you in thanks so much for the presentation this great variety of projects that you have talked about i was wondering um about um, the extension of man, which you brought up, and uh, the idea that we maybe um, are not really doing interactive documentary any longer, but are kind of expanding documentary and also 
evolving in the sense of growing when we bring in again this metaphor of uh, entanglements and environment. Could you maybe um, go a bit more into detail about this and also the idea of the post-Anthropocene? Well, I, I would pick up on the, the idea of expanding, you know, documentary augment, augmenting and expanding and the idea of interactive documentary because what's been very handy for us is that we've been curating eye docs so we've been able to open up the eye and and play with all the different types of eyes so there's interactive there's immersive but there's also intraactive and um, Karen Barard's idea of intra action fits with Tim Ingold's idea of corresponding and that that is much more interaction suggests there's there's a there's something solid that we're interacting with we're a solid thing and we're interacting with another solid thing whereas intra action gives more of a sense of porous porosity between between those things and, and a correspondence and an entanglement so uh, i'm as interested in intra action as inter or Im interaction or immersive action or <laughs> You know, so so um, the, the the plurality of the eye, I think, has, has been really helpful for us so that we don't get too stuck on on words, I guess. And interactive documentary, the web based stuff that that's just the word that was coined, you know, for, for that form of agency. But it's, it's all, all these work, you know, they all have their problematics in, in terms of definition. But I, I would say I'm definitely moving towards the corresponding the intra action and the entanglements that, that come with that and the more the porosity that you know we, we're not a fixed entity that interacts with the external world as another fixed entity it's as Sandra was saying there's, there's much more of a, a dynamic relationship between us too many Sandra? people at the same time. No, I actually wanted to turn the question to Anna because I mean she's she's part of the community and uh, you know mm -hmm. she's um, she, for sure you have your own point of view and I'm interested in yours. So mm -hmm. um, when you ask that question, what is it that was kind of um, itching? It was um, the interactive in the sense of tech-based stuff again, which mm -hmm. um, also binds us to the web and to the screen and uh, not really um, having this engagement, which for example, in Mandy Rose's examples came through um, so well, because it's not just um, the solitary experience of the XR or VR with one's goggles on, but you're walking through the, through the forest beforehand. And with Sandra, it's moving in one's own place. And with Judith's example of the polyphony, it is again, um, this augmentation in the sense of making myself humble, making me small in terms of I'm not the master of the story, but I'm um, yeah, handing over a kind of false agency in order to assume a more responsible and responsive agency towards our world, towards what we are interacting with, not only the text, the pieces, but also um, nature, the others, the social um, sphere in all these projects, I think that makes them really extraordinary. Oh, again, an ex extraordinary documentaries. And that's a really great point about this more responsive agency, right? That mm -hmm. agency was so much in classical film studies located in an individual, right? And located as um, uh, being kind of monological. Um, you know, I'm listening to this and I'm, I'm struck by how we might be moving to e-docs because of the words people are using, extension, engagement, expanding, Extension. enmeshed, evolving, entangled, and extraordinary. So thank you for opening a whole new terrain to, for us, uh, Anna. Uh, let's bring uh, Kaylin into the conversation. Hello, um, I have a question about technology in general, but it does um, also relate to virtual reality. Um, so if I were to purchase um, an Oculus VR headset today, I would need a Facebook account to start using it, allowing Meta to mm. collect and store my data, um, including short voice recordings. So 
You all discussed um, today moving beyond technology, but do you think that makers and researchers have any responsibility to recognize these issues um, in their work? And um, do you see any way out of the system beyond simply using the tools of big tech for good? Thank you for a very good question. Yeah. Now, very I good. kind of, I have a habit of compartmentalizing my enthusiasm for certain ways of harnessing this media and my concerns about some of the ethical problematics, you know, I, partly because I just don't know how to talk about them together, right? Because I, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Some of the, you know, the tech giants are not just kind of, you know, the masters of this space, but worse than that, these, um, some of these tools are instruments of surveillance capitalism in quite an extreme form. I left Facebook, what, four or five years ago? Yeah. And I recently had to make an account to use um, an Oculus uh, Quest that I'd borrowed from the university. So I haven't populated my account, but I, I have an account again, which I resent so deeply. There are some, there are, there are headsets that aren't owned by Meta. You know, it's not the only game in town, but it's very dominant. So, you know, so I think I'm, I, I'm grateful for your point. I don't have a kind of simple sort of response to it, except in a way to think about, you know, the, 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 the ambiguity or ambivalence of these platforms, right? You know, there is, you know, the irony of trying to get closer to nature within a VR headset, you know, is not lost on me, right? Um, you know, um, How can you be I, more detached? <laughs> somebody I work with, uh, Kerry Facer, has this great idea. She talk, says, you know, digital is both a, an impediment and a resource. And I'm afraid kind of that's where I kind of sit with it, that this stuff is very ambiguous. And um, the ethics, I think that, you know, there are lots of deep problems. I could point you to a lecture I've done elsewhere on this, but I don't have a kind of easy answer, um, except to keep those issues in our, you know, close to us and keep pushing on it and use the open and free platforms when we can. And I, I just want to jump in here and uh, bring a historian's perspective. Uh, Eric Barnow, one of the person who wrote the first book on documentary in our field, uh, wrote a great piece long ago where he said, every new technology in the history of media is met with equal measures of despair and hope, mm -hmm. right? And we have to keep both of those at play all the time. And I think uh, you are channeling Eric Barnow, Mandy, when you say it's an impediment and a resource. Uh, these are, are both there and they are constantly entangled. And I think we have to always remember uh, use value and how they are used, context, histories often trump technological determinism. Um, and so um, let's, let's get uh, Liam Donovan in. Hi, uh, so I had a quick question uh, with the past year or few years now with COVID, have we seen a positive or a negative impact on the eye documentary industry? Uh, from what point of view, uh, Liam? What, what, what do you mean by positive and negative? Um, well, you know, there are some times where it's like it could be positive where you have more time where you're working on technology and you're able to develop these stories and documentaries or there could be the negative of you aren't able to go outside, get some of the resources you need in order to fully document this. Um, so I was just curious if there are any like you guys faced of like major problems or easier, or major successes. Well, in in our in the polyphonic documentary project, we the the clips that we got in they all came from June 2021 when when we were all still pretty much sheltering in place. So that, that was a turn towards the local. So that, that came across very clearly in the pieces. They were more intimate and they were more personal because they were real reflections on our own locality. So I guess that's one of the things that, you know, in, in terms of deglobalization, if you like, you know, the, the turning back into one's own locality and really appreciating, you know, the rhythm of the day, the kind of the trees, the spring, the seasons or whatever, and, and really taking the time to, to reflect on that. There's quite a few people here who are part of this project. And, you know, that 
So, so that's a kind of a turn in terms of the gaze and, and where we're looking and the kind of documentaries that we're making that are more locally based. And, and certainly, you know, in the documentary industry now, it, it's about using local crews where possible and, and not, you know, spending lots of money on shipping people all around the world and, you know, um, and, and the whole um, carbon footprint of that. So that that's one positive, I think. But also, Judith, uh, um, I, I think what happened during the lockdown, since we were all, you know, sort of uh, locked, um, we had to resource to digital media to be in contact. And so there has been an explosion of um, projects, of initiative, um, sometimes very small, sometimes between friends, uh, community. Um, so there's been a huge explosion. And actually, since we have you know, a lot of people here with us, I, I really would be curious to know if you, know, if, if you all did put down on the chat you know, one project that you maybe collaborated with during, uh, you know, the two years of the pandemic, something that, you know, it could be just between friends, because I think that for me was the big positive thing is that um, we were all forced to use um, uh, the web, digital uh, media in general to have meaningful relationship with each other, because this is what we were craving for. And therefore, there's been an explosion, and this has proved to most of us that actually, you know, um, this is a medium for personal creativity if we wanted to. We don't need to wait for the big project, you know, um, the big box thing, you know. So it, that for me is very positive. I'd love to know if you had, if you were all of you um, part of something during a pandemic, or whether you followed something else, um, so that we can all learn from what you, what fed you, because I think that that was. Mm -hmm. And thank you for the question, Liam, and thank you for the suggestion, Sandra. And I'd like to ask all of our participants if you if you're willing to share um, something new that happened with UN technology during the pandemic. It would be great to collect those in the chat. I'd like to bring Maria Cristoforu into our uh, discussion here. Hi, Maria. Hello. <laughs> I was honored to participate to Corona High was project. I was, <laughs> hi Sandra, hi everyone. So nice to have you here, thank you. Thank you. Hi from Cyprus. <laughs> the time is much different here. We are six hours ahead. Uh, so as I was saying, I was uh, very happy and honored to participate to Corona High was project and to be a co-curator as well. It, it is an amazing project uh, for me. And it was a project, a co-creative project that we share many uh, emotions. Um, we reach more than 1,000 participants. Um, it was, the project was presented in conferences, in exhibitions, in journals, and um, I would like to ask uh, Sandra because uh, I have my own opinion as well. Uh, but yeah, I was going to say, Sandra this is going to be a question that is going to turn around <laughs> yes. to you. <laughs> so, what makes this project so special, and what, in your opinion, are the qualities of its success? Well, first, I'll try to be a bit modest in the sense that success is a big word, yeah? Uh, we're, we're speaking about uh, a community of a thousand people around the whole world who mm -hmm. collaborating, doing visual poetry. So that's not humongous numbers in today's world, yeah? So if we were to think of success as mm -hmm. numbers and people reached, I mean, we, we can actually think of ourselves as a very small community. The success for me has been as a complete personal level, and you know, I'd, I'd love to have your point of view, is the, um, the authenticity of the sharings and the fact that uh, people have uh, shared things that really moved me. And they moved me at a moment where I actually needed to have faith in humanity and our, our capacity to first be together, but also in our capacity to reinvent ourselves when we're stuck, because that's the bit that was really difficult, that, you know, we felt um, that nothing was moving. And for me, what the project showed, but that it, it became a tool to move within 
um, you know, a super, a very still environment. I can move even if I'm just sitting in this room by the way I look at it, by the, my capacity to take three photos and come up with poetry, which is something that no one does anymore, pretty much. And even to share it on a social media where normally, you know, poetry is not on you know, the major thing that is put forward and create something beautiful and moving. And so it's so simple and at the same time, um, you know, really profound. And so for me, that is the success on a completely personal level. But I mean, since you were part of it, tell me what moved you. I mean, uh, it's, it's a qualitative success more than a quantitative, I would say. Mm -hmm. Each of us gets yeah. something different from it. Yeah. You said before that we were forced to use digital media. In our case, with Corona High, we were not forced at all. I mean, we did yeah. this with a pleasure. It was, for me, it was a form of catharsis to... Mm -hmm to participate to this project because it was my moment to be creative during the pandemic. We, I felt vulnerable like most of us. Uh, yeah. We share the same emotions. Um, so many participants from different countries. Uh, there were moments that um, individual stories became a homogenous story. Uh, this mm -hmm. was amazing and we felt so much connected i we enjoyed every moment i enjoy every moment we we share our comments through facebook at the beginning then we built uh, the website uh, then i presented this project to to my exhibition in cyprus which was amazing and it got amazing uh, results i presented the project in a rai conference and in a royal anthropology conference as well so when I can still that the, the, the project progress now with augmented reality, etc. So I, I think it is an endless journey. <laughs> and it, it's the journey that matters. <laughs> As mm -hmm. Kavapi says, the journey matters uh, more. Um, so yes, I would like to share this experience with everyone. And um, thanks, Sandra, again mm -hmm. for this Thank you, Maria. opportunity. Sorry. And Maria, oh, thank talking? you for a great comment there. Uh, I like your comment about the journey, because I think that as I listen to these presentations and people coming on screen in this discussion, uh, there seems to be this great opening up and willingness to go on journeys into the unknown. And it's a very exciting moment in documentary now. So I found what you said very moving. Thank you so much. I'd like to uh, thank you, Maria, and I'd like to bring Ashish Kumar into the conversation. Welcome, Ashish. So nice to see you, Ashish. Uh, hi, everybody. Yes, Sandra, good to see you too. And uh, uh, I appreciate Ju Judith's comment about bringing Eastern meditations on this very theme. In fact, uh, as I sat, uh, especially when, uh, when uh, we were discussing uh, uh, the, uh, the trilogy project about uh, nature and human, the dichotomy and the binary and uh, kind of finding the nature within us, it almost felt like, you know, it could have been a lecture on the Upanishads or the Bhagavad Gita. Um, so mm -hmm. clearly this, <laughs> there is plenty and I'm in the presence of many gurus here. Uh, Sandra, most directly, and most easily, but all of you. Um, uh, is there a way to, to sort of, without getting into that whole debate about who was there first, right? Uh, is there a way to both honor and, um, and respectfully borrow from traditions that have been meditating on these very issues that mm -hmm. in some ways, and I think of it as, you know, the documentary became a victim of the positivist trend where we thought if we could render the world visually and we could mm -hmm. aggregate and we would get to know it. And now we are sort of in the realm of that there are these molecular relationships that are unknowable through this, just the mere visual. Mm -hmm. And so these the ideas of connecting these very contemporary um, and obviously very mesmerizing trends. And I'm Part of you know, I'm a devotee. I'm a learner in the spaces, but I also resonate very much with what I'm learning and how it brings me to uh, some very ancestral spaces, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, and it, in fact, there's a very good volume, and I think some of you have contributed to that as well. That attempts to do that, uh, and I'm going to put the link in there uh, to talk about decolonizing practice-based research in interactive spaces. Yeah. And how mm -hmm. do we how do we how do we do this in a in a way that 
balances out because I was in India um, a few a few years ago, uh, looking at what interactive and VR technologies are available there, and we started thinking about making a network of global South institutions that might be might might have access to this so that can they can even begin contributing because the doors right now are very locked. Um, so that's my two cents. Can, uh, can that's I a respond? great two cents, and let's get yeah, Judith great. in and yeah. some other folks to comment. So uh, Ashish, I wanted to say that volume that you're talking about, the chapter two is, is about polyphony, its history and its future in evolving documentary practices. And, you know, we've been looking at Bakhtin uh, and, um, you know, his ideas of the polyphonic novel, but actually our next project, and Stefan and I have just, have just agreed on this, is to decolonize polyphony and to, to look at exactly at what you're saying about those different traditions, you know, around the world, those different knowledge systems that, you know, have really been um, thinking and engaging. And that, that book chapter, we, we talk very much about the, the kind of Western binaries and the Western rational ways of thinking that, you know, even my generation was brought up in the educational model and, and I, in my teaching, I'm very interested, you know, I'm kind of doing an informal ethnography of young people. And, and I, I, my sense, and Florian has a lot to say about this, is, is that younger people are less, well, certainly my students and my children are less binary and much more fluid and much more open. And, you know, the jury's out, which way is the world going? But actually looking at other knowledge systems and indigenous knowledge systems, the Upanishads, absolutely, you know, Tibetan worldviews and um you know it, it's it's us with our scientific you know uh, it, science is good but that kind of cartesian duality and that split between body and mind that led to science and modernity you know that's our problem and we we need to look beyond that and that's again the transformations and i i could bring bharat in when you're talking about india as one of do you want do you want to say a quick word yeah okay, let's get mandy in here she has her hand up yeah yeah yeah, I did. The thing that I had to take out to keep my presentation in five minutes was mm. to talk a little bit about how in virtual spaces, in these spatial environments of VR, people have been doing a lot of work with time and making pieces that have to do with kind of speculative futures and in particular, um, indigenous creators. Um, and it's worth saying it's a resource, a really important resource. There's a website called Fourth VR, which actually brings together all the indigenous virtual reality work that's been done um, by uh, Kezia Wallace and Miriam Ross. So there's a website that does that, though notably in terms of the point you made, this is mostly in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, Canada, um, some work in Australia too, but much less so far in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, although there is an organization called Electric South, which is supporting VR work there. So, so just to say that, I mean, that it's interesting how Indigenous makers have harnessed virtual reality and harnessed that spatial dimension to make work which asks about futures. I was going to reference a piece called Be Darben by um, an Indigenous Canadian artist called Lisa Jackson, which, um, which conjures a, a, a Toronto in ruins once nature has overtaken the city and does this very interesting kind of turn because when you start the piece, it seems like a kind of dystopian vision and gradually the introduction of indigenous voices through 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 quotes and sayings suggest just kind of begins to suggest another way of thinking about it which is a through a longer kind of time span beyond the human life a much longer time span which is kind of suggested by a kind of indigenous perspective on time so yeah so i think that's a very interesting aspect that's going on in vr as well and, and thanks so much uh, ashish for your um for your contribution uh you use the I word honor and borrow it. from traditions and i'm struck by you know there are debates about in engaging traditions from outside of where you live as being a new form of extractivism Mm -hmm. right, of, of grabbing these ideas. Uh, we know this from the hippie movement in the 60s and 70s. And I wonder mm -hmm. if perhaps there might be a way to start thinking about this in, uh, as in pluriversal terms as not that we are taking these traditions, but that we are in relationship and in dialogue with them 
Uh, so I really appreciate what you had to say. And um, I, I do want to add something before we get Rachel on the screen about polyphony. Um, you know, in music theory, uh, polyphony is the more dominant form of music in the world. And it is Western European music in the rise of the classical period in the 18th century that destroyed polyphony to create a unified narrative. So I'm just gonna throw out there and while we're decolonizing, we've got Indonesian gamelan, we've got polyphonic drumming in West Africa. We have all kinds of uh, musical forms in uh, particularly Brazil that layer. And I, I wanna make sure we get that word polyphony outside of uh, Bach and the Baroque. So I'm gonna bring uh, Rachel Geary in here. Wait, uh, we'll bring I, Rachel I... Geary in, but we'll we'll have Sandra make a comment. Go, go for it, Sandra. Oh, can I, sorry. <laughs> Actually, I didn't want to do a comment myself, but I thought that because um, I can see that Florian is is with us, Florian Falthofer, and actually he's very much, you know, one of the person who was really putting polyphony as how, how can we do IDOX in a polyphonic way? And and Judith mentioned him. I thought maybe maybe we could include you, uh, Florian, in this because the discussion is not us replying, but most uh, hopefully a whole group of people thinking together about those topics. So um, I would love to have your point of view, Florian. Hello, nice to see you, by the way. <laughs> nice to see you. Thank you for uh, bringing me in now a, a bit. Uh, what should I say? It's all uh, um, really fascinating and there are like a lot of words flying around and I have uh, difficulties understanding what what uh, what is really going on there or to bring it into match with uh, the things that that uh, that I see. Um, yeah, but I mean, I was um, I think that the more than human or the non-human is like that idea is that we, we can use these new media tools to get out of ourselves, get an understanding for the non-human to basically turn around and have a look at us again. So we, we need to get outside first to then get an overview over us and what we are experiencing, I think at the moment with all the projects is that we are connected to, to each other. We are in a way one organism and this is what we are experiencing at the moment. This is how I feel uh, about the situation that, that uh, also with COVID uh, um, um, was really enforced. And basically for that, we need computers and this technology that is out there and we are exploring all these ways. What a wonderful comment, going outside to get inside, to go outside again. And again, I'm, I'm noting by your comment, uh, even as you say, all these words are flying around that we, you know, what we've really done here, something Anna Vial mentioned in the chat is we're opening up spaces for evolving brainstorming. So I want to thank you, Florian. Uh, really a wonderful comment. Uh, let's get Rachel in and that'll be our last uh, question comment. Hi. Um, so my question that I have um, is kind of involving the user experience of these projects. Um, I was wondering if any of these projects, and this is a question for anyone, um, provides insight into the demographics of the people like uh, logging on online to these works. Um, because I'm just curious who makes up the user experience of these projects and who is potentially left out and what the information of the people who are left out can inform us about these projects. Um, so I, did, I just didn't know if there were any um, uh, insights into the demographics. I suspect it depends on the project. Um, everything that is on the web, uh, potentially you could actually uh, chase the demographic pretty much of who has been using them and for how long. Um, on VR, I don't know, Mandy, on VR. Yeah, no, well, I've got, I've got to say that VR. I mean, for a long time, I felt very preoccupied with how VR was kind of, how all these fantastic creative people were devoting themselves to VR. And it felt like it was kind of, a lot of the pieces felt like they were marooned on the festival circuit. Festivals are great, 
but that's not the only audience you want to relate to, you know, and it's a particular audience and it's an, an audience which excludes as well as includes. So um, things have changed quite a lot with VR with, you know, like the Steam platform, you can get a lot of work through Steam. Um, again, I'm, 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 I'm thinking of May Abdullah's recent piece, uh, Goliath, which is really popular. It kind of comes up as the first piece you see on the Steam platform when you go online. So, so there are now, you know, forms of distribution, exhibition um, of that kind. But, it, you know, thinking about those marshmallow laser, piece, laser feast pieces, you know, the first one was showed at a festival, you know, a, a festival of new media. Um, people visited it in a forest. Some people stumbled upon it, but that's how it was accessed. Um, we saw um, the second piece, Tree Hugger, at the London Film Festival. And the third piece, really interestingly, played for more than six months at the Saatchi Gallery in London. Right, so that was a very particular audience. Um, I think Sachi were happy that it it, it encouraged some uh, younger people and some people who wouldn't normally go to see to see the art there. But it was a paid for experience, which was sold out at like I think it was sort of a fiver or something like that. No, 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 no. It was expensive because I went with oh, my God. students and we had to pay twenty pounds. It was super oh expensive. God. Yeah, okay. and so people were I remembered. But yeah, okay. So very particular context very particular audience um so yeah so i'm by no what you know i'm trying to suggest that these vr pieces are relatively inaccessible and have particular or particular audiences you know mm -hmm. if you think about steam it's going to be an audience has a lot, of, a lot of gamers involved um so that's a particular kind of demographic mm -hmm. yeah so and yeah it's it's clear that there's a digital divide i mean on these there is no no you know no no issue and the more the technology is expensive the more you know your demographic is uh, is split in two mm. it's also partly the reason for which we were using against our you know normal inclination for in corona hikers we used um social media which in a way is a democratization for as much as we hate facebook uh, you know it, but it's a way to reach out to a lot of people who don't own the last the last computer or you know or live in a big city where there is a fancy festival so that it's very much of a trade-off sorry to uh, a, great, a great question i think we're going to have to move to our takeaways right now i'm sorry judith save it for the takeaway okay because we are running out of time uh the sign of a great session when people have more to say than we can fit in the screen. So uh, we're going to move to our takeaways. Before we do that, I want to thank everybody who came on the screen and contributed ideas and, and galvanized us. I'm going to uh, move to our takeaways and closing thoughts. I'm going to be extremely strict here, and I'm going to ask each of our presenters to uh, share a closing thought, a takeaway, or a new unresolved idea that we um, that got exposed in our discussions today. Okay, so closing thought, takeaway, or a new idea. You'll have one minute. I'm going to be very strict uh, because our producers want us to begin and end on time. Uh, so I'm going to start with Mandy. Yeah, well, I think the thing that I'm going to think I'm going to take away and perhaps think about first um, from this conversation is around that issue of indigenous perspectives. Um, and I, I think that whole kind of question of building on while paying respect to and appreciating the the history of violence that there's been towards indigenous people, keeping that kind of front of mind feels to me a really important, they're, you know, they're important themes and questions. Um, and I'm happy to say in a way that the fourth VR website, you know, allows us to, 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 to take note, to listen, to, to hear some of those perspectives. Um, but yeah, I guess that's, that's, um, I really like what you said about it, Patty, that idea that, you know, it's about thinking, thinking, you know, not taking from traditions, but kind of thinking in relation to them. And I, you know, I, I, yeah, I feel I'm going to take that away as because it's such that the theme of, um, you know, what what Judith talked about as the pluriverse, the theme of the kind of multiple, multiple um, worldviews and kind of knowledge systems is one that's really coming up here. I think it's super interesting and, you know, and, and challenging too. Excellent, thank you, and right on time. Judith. 
Um, yeah, I'm just sort of musing on, you know, my role. So I, I'm very involved with the Royal Anthropological Institute. So I'm sort of chair of their film committee now. So, and they've got a huge archive of, um, uh, you know, recordings that, you know, one could say a lot of those are very colonial because because they were, they were filmed at a certain time, but there are also recordings that record ways and cultures that, you know, um, if they hadn't, those recordings hadn't been made, there would be no visual document of them. And it's almost, you've got to get beyond the colonial gaze give them back to communities and, and use those archives and those recordings to start a conversation about in, indigenous cultures and in, indigenous knowledge with you know, indigenous cultures that are, are vibrant and alive today. So I'm, I'm really interested in, in, in that and, and what I'm sitting on in, in that role at the Royal, you know, in, in the RAI and how that can feed back into IDOCs. And also just really quickly, the Polyphonic Documentary Project is looking at us as authors and as makers and IDOX practitioners and looking at how we can use those tools to shift, shift our own perspectives that then we can take back out into the world, into our projects. And those projects may be film projects, they may be community engagement projects, they, they may be teaching in schools or they may be our teaching. But you know, rather than thinking about audiences and making things for an external audience, making things within our co-creative community to help shift collaboratively our own thinking and um, is is our position on audience thank, i guess thank you so much judith uh mm -hmm. let's go to sandra yeah so i think what i got from you know listening to everybody was uh this this apparent tension maybe contradiction between we're speaking here about how can we relate to our environment uh you know in a more expanded way and then we're using the digital which by definition is actually non-physical so there is there is a contradiction and that is what I'll take with me and think about how can we use the digital actually as a prompt? So how can the agency that is within our digital piece be a prompt to actually be physical with our physical environment? So that might be a way out of it. And um, that's what I'll, um, I'll, I'll keep from today. Thank you, such provocative takeaways. And, um, uh, you know, I just wanna end by saying, uh, you know, what an expansive uh, session this has been. Uh, I'd really uh, like to thank everybody who came and stayed on this uh, session the entire time as we took a, a big swim in ideas of fresh encounters of aspects of the non-human and thinking beyond the human eye and mixed reality with Mandy. As Sandra asked us to think about augmentation as to make things bigger, visible, uh, differently, to think about uh, change and transformation in terms of viruses uh, and to think in terms of kind of relational agencies involved in viruses, threats, war, and change. And Judith uh, pushing us all to think about the two Ps, polyphony and pluriverses. And I think when I look at all of this together and I look at what we've done together, uh, it seems to be our central driving force here is relationships, engagement, interaction, and conversation. So I wanna thank all 55 people on this Zoom for exactly providing that. Uh, it's something we all need so desperately now. I'm gonna hand it over to Annie Michelle, our producer. Thank you all for coming. We have a party favor for everybody. It's in the chat. Uh, it's a chat archive, grab it, it's a PDF. So you can keep all those great references that we made. We're gonna have our after party after I roll the credits, but first, Please unmute and a big round of applause for our fantastic people who gave us so much today. We'll see you all at the after party.